us to think for a moment about how we develop our knowledge and beliefs. Think about when we start off as children. When we first come into this world, when we first begin our lives, what do we know? What do we believe? It's not as if we we start out with this pre-programmed set of information, set of ideas that we have in our minds. We, We start out essentially knowing nothing. Everything that we take in, everything that we grow and mature to, to gain knowledge of as we go throughout our lives, it's gained from the outside. It's gained from sources outside of us. We have to go through the learning process. Now, as we get old enough and we develop our, our cognition, we can begin to take things that we do already know and then use logic and things like that to be able to, to piece together other things. But still, all of that comes at its core, from things that we learn from other sources. And so when we think about how that works and how everything that we know and and everything that we understand and, and believe about life, we have to learn from the outside, we must realize that we're constantly then surrounded by information, surrounded by messages that are coming in, trying to influence us, trying to get us to believe certain things, one way or another, trying to get us to adopt certain worldviews, certain ways of thinking. So what we listen to, these messages, this information that we take in, those that we choose to listen to, that will shape our beliefs. That will shape our actions. When we think about Galatians 5 and verse 9, it says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The idea there is that Even a little bit of of something can can influence and spread. So even a a message that's just one message maybe that we we hear, that can start growing in our minds and and helping us to to develop a worldview. And because that's how that works, we have to always make sure that the messages that we are taking in, the information that we are gathering, the way that we're learning, we have to understand and make sure that all of that is coming from the sources that it needs to come from, ultimately being God. Because unless our messages, unless our information is coming from God, then we're going to develop beliefs and ideas that are not from God. God has to be the foundation of who we are, and therefore what we take in has to be from Him. You know, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33 says, evil companions corrupt good morals. We quote this often, but The idea is there that if we take in information that's not from God, if we take in information that is of the world, then what will we become? What will we begin to believe and practice? Even Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That very idea, faith comes by hearing. That's how we gain this knowledge. And so as we think tonight about this concept, I want us to look at three different aspects of hearing God's word and no one else's. And first, as we think about that, we need to hear God's word and not the world's. Now this probably seems like the most obvious aspect of this. We're we're told constantly when it comes to Christianity that we need to, to listen to scripture and not whatever the world may tell us, right? I mean, after all, we understand the world does not truly accept God. Now, there are many in the world who who claim to accept God, but they do not accept what he says. They do not follow what he says. There are many religions in this world that claim to, to have affiliation with some type of God. And yet, when it comes down to it, their messages are not from him because they do not accord with what he has given us in his word. In Matthew 7, 21, we see Jesus describing a situation where men come to him and and they say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these wonderful things in in your name? And he says, that's that's not what matters, is whether or not you call on me, whether or not you call me Lord. It's whether you're doing what I have instructed you to do. And so the world does not truly accept God. But not only that, you know, in America, we we have this concept, and, and there's reason for it, that in some ways our, our culture and our country is, is somewhat friendly to faith, somewhat friendly to Christianity. Now that's certainly changing, 
But historically, there is a definite aspect that the, the country has supported institutions of faith as an integral part of a solid society. And yet, they may seem friendly to our faith, but if they are not actually accepting of it, they do not actually share our allegiance to it. In John 15, verses 18 through 20, John 15, 18 through 20, Jesus here is speaking to his disciples. This is the last conversation he will have with them, essentially, before he is taken away. In verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, know that you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. And so here we see that those who are of the world, meaning those who have not accepted the message that God has given us and respond to that in obedience, they will reject the word and therefore they will reject us because they will reject the one who sends us, which is Christ, and they reject him, uh, or the one who sent him, which is God. And so, while the world may seem friendly to our faith when it doesn't oppose them, you know, it may seem friendly to our faith when we're out helping the needy, or it may seem friendly to our faith when we're, we're doing these things that promote healthy society, it's not friendly to the entirety of our faith, because in the end, anyone who stands for the truth is perceived as a threat by those who wish to reject truth, who wish to remain in darkness. And we understand all these things, and we understand that the messages of the world are everywhere. We're surrounded by the world. We, after all, live in the world. And we can't just exit the world. I mean, even Paul speaks about the fact that we we, we can't be not in the world, but yet we're not supposed to be of the world. We understand those things. And yet, even though there are many aspects of of worldly messages that we can see and and spot immediately, oftentimes there are many that are put under the radar that we don't often see, that are hard to spot. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves being influenced by these without even realizing it. You know, if if you look, for example, in the realm of politics, no matter what particular political affiliation or government structure you may prefer, there are often on every side aspects and elements of worldviews that are put forward that are directly related and usually contradictory to what is said in Scripture. And yet, because it's politics and because it's removed from an actual religious setting, oftentimes we can separate the two and not realize that we're actually being presented with some form of a religious worldview. When we look at the news, you know, there's so many news sources that claim to be unbiased, right? And that is such a, a biased statement. But nonetheless, we have to understand that pretty much every news source, and really every person, but especially today, the news sources that we see, they have a particular worldview that they're going off of. Again, whichever side it may be, there is a particular worldview, and that's being presented in the news, and it may not be blatant. Usually, it's, it's just in the way things are worded. It's, it's not explicit statements, but it's, it's just twisted just enough that you imply certain things about the story or about the event that it's recording. And that perpetrates that worldview in people's minds. Entertainment is another very prominent example of this. We look at entertainment throughout the years, and and we see the progression of what has been inserted into entertainment. And we understand, certainly, that as the world changes, as society changes, entertainment is going to change. But oftentimes, we may fail to realize that, in many cases, the ideas, the concepts, the worldviews were inserted into things like entertainment first, before it really became mainstream. And that actually contributed to this idea and this acceptance of certain worldviews as we went through our society. I mean, a great example of this is the idea of homosexuality. 
you look at early cinema and, and early TV shows, and if it was ever presented, it was presented as a very fringe type thing, and then it it gradually became presented as maybe just a, a a comedic character, and then and then it became presented as as just well, you know, kind of a a, a slight normalcy. And then now, you can't watch a TV show without at least one or two gay characters always presented in a positive light. What is that doing? That's slowly and gradually setting in our minds the idea that such behavior is normal, that such behavior is widely accepted, when in fact, although it is growing, the fact is that's, it's, that's not true. It's not widely accepted among the majority of people. Certainly not as a lifestyle that people participate in themselves. And so we have to understand that the most effective way, for good or evil, that you can teach someone, that you can begin to convince someone of a point of view, is not to just explicitly throw it in their face, but to show them, to present things in front of them, like Jesus did with the parables, present illustrations, present, present ways of showing them these, these things in action. And it starts to go into their minds and they start to piece these things together. It wasn't explicitly stated, but they're piecing it together for themselves. And they begin to take root. Those ideas begin to sink in. We have to be careful of that. Because that's a very, very prominent aspect of how Satan can infiltrate our minds into things that we may not even realize are contrary to God's word. So we have to be careful when we're interacting with the world to spot those messages and to recognize that anything that we take in from the world has to be seen in light of Scripture. That doesn't mean that the things we take in from the world do not have any merit to them. Of course, there are aspects of, of messages from the world that have merit. There are many things we can learn from the world in terms of, excuse me, in terms of examples of, of kindness, in terms of examples um, oftentimes of even evangelism and, and things like that. People who are ha- don't even have anything close to the truth but are still zealous and and have fervor for whatever they may believe. We can learn those aspects from them. We can learn how to do mechanical things, you know, things in our secular jobs, all that kind of information we can learn from the world. But we have to recognize that the good things are not original to the world. Every good thing, every good concept and worldview eventually comes back to God. And so we have to recognize those things are tainted because they come from the world and be on guard for that. So hear God's word and not the world's. But number two, hear God's word and not other Christians. Hold on. What? Not other Christians. Christians are supposed to be supporting one another. They're supposed to be encouraging and, and teaching one another, right? That, that is part of our role. What, what do we mean, hear God's word and not other Christians? You look at Romans 10.24, we should be stirring one another up to love and good works, right? Indeed, that is the case. But there's an important distinction we have to make. Yes, we are, as the church, to love and support one another. Yes, we are to teach one another. Teach in song, teach in, in venues like this. Study the Bible with one another. Have spiritual discussions. Encourage one another in our personal spiritual growth outside these four walls. That's all part of what the church is supposed to do. But that's with a proper understanding of where the message that we should be listening to is coming from. Because we must never twist this function so that we rely on Christians instead of God, instead of God's word and what he has told us. Because if we do that, if we start taking our brother and sister in Christ, taking their word without checking it with the scriptures, without examining it as the Bereans did in Acts 17.11 to see whether these things are so, if we ever fall into that trap, we can get into severe trouble. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 13. We see an excellent example of the dangers of this trap. 1 Kings chapter 13. In this instance, we have a prophet. And he's a prophet of God, and he's been told to deliver a message. And he goes and delivers this message, but before he goes, he's instructed not to stop anywhere on his way back, not to stop and eat, not to stop and do anything, but to go give the message and return. And we see in verse 11 of chapter 13, Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, 
And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God, this prophet that we spoke of, had done that day in Bethel. And they also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to him, which way did he go? For his sons, his sons had seen the way the man, of God who, who, the man of God went who came from Judah. Then he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him. And he rode out and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And so he has a conversation with him in verse 15. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. And the prophet repeated his instructions. He, he can't stop and eat bread. He's been told by the Lord, don't stop, don't eat bread, don't drink water. But then notice in verse 18, he, talking about the, the old prophet, he said to him, I too am a prophet, as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat and drink, eat bread and drink water. But in parentheses, we see that the author tells us he was lying to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now it happened as they said at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought, brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God commanded you. But you came back, ate bread and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. And we see that after this instance, the prophet went out and he went on the road to go back to his home and a lion met him and he met his end that very day. What happened? He had his instructions. Why did he violate his instructions? Another prophet. Another prophet. We don't know what kind of prophet exactly, but at least in this instance, God himself did speak through this prophet. Another prophet told him that he had a message from God. And instead of listening to what he had received directly from God, instead of confirming that this was indeed a message from God that he was hearing, the young prophet turned in and disobeyed God's command. And it may not always be an instance like this. This text specifically says this prophet was lying. But it doesn't matter what the motivation is. Sometimes Christians simply get it wrong. Sometimes our fellow brethren are, are mistaken in some way or another. And then sometimes it may be that they indeed do have ulterior motives and malicious intent. But either way, if we rely on what those in the church say as authority into itself without checking with the scriptures, without confirming that indeed this is the truth, we can be led astray just like they are. Acts 18 provides another excellent example of this with Apollos. He was very zealous to preach, but he only had the, the baptism of John. That was all he had to preach. And if, if people had just accepted his word, and it's very possible that some did just accept his word without checking into it, without going further into it, they could have been led astray because they didn't have all the information that they needed. But thankfully, he was confronted and taught more correctly the what, what he needed to preach. And he received that. He accepted that because his intent was not ill. But then we see in other situations, like in first, or excuse me, third John, that we talked about this morning, there are brethren who may have malicious intent, who may fall away and make things about themselves. In either case, we have to hear God's word and not other Christians because God's word is what will ultimately judge us and is what will ultimately guide our lives to be the best life that we can have so that we may receive our reward. So hear God's word and not the world, world's. Hear God's word and not other Christians but we also need to hear God's word and not our own. This one, ultimately, is the underlying concept. Because when it really comes down to it, who makes the decision to listen to a message from the world? Who makes the decision to hear a message from another Christian rather than confirming with Scripture? If I, if I listen to those messages, I'm the one who chose to do that, right? Right? I'm not forced to listen to a message from the world or, or to listen to a message from another Christian. I'm the one who makes that choice. So ultimately, when I do that, yes, I'm, I'm accepting their message, but I'm relying on my own word, on my own authority to do those things. If you look in Galatians 5, 
Galatians 5, 16 through 18. It says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What is this talking about? This is bringing out the point that, as Paul is saying, and I believe we mentioned this even this morning, we have both a physical element of our existence, but we also have a spiritual element of our existence. The physical element has desires. It has aspects of, of this earth that it wants and that it needs. We, we do need food. We do need clothing. We do need many things in this world. And then there's the spirit, and the spirit has the conscience. The spirit understands what we sh- actually should do. The spirit is the, the moral aspect. It contains the moral aspect of our being among other things, and of course we can get into a discussion of that later. But the idea here is that you have the part of ourselves that has desires that can go awry, and then you have the part of ourselves that knows right from wrong. And these two don't always want the same thing. These two can clash. These two types of desires can clash with one another to where we have to fight against ourselves, in a sense. We have to suppress, if you will, our own word, our own will, and instead submit that to God and his will. And this is difficult, because after all, we are ourselves. We, we are the ones in charge of our own lives. That's, that's our role on this earth, is, is to take charge of what God has given us, our bodies, our spirits, all the resources that we have. That's that's what we are, is, is beings with choice, beings with, with choices to make between good and evil. And sometimes, whether it's because of misunderstandings, whether it's because of temptations, it can be very tempting to rely on our own ideas, our own perceptions, our own ways of thinking about what is actually correct, what is actually true and, and real. But in Proverbs 3 and verse 5, Solomon says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. He's setting these two at odds again. Our own understanding and what the Lord tells us may not always come together in the way that we'd like them to. They may not always make sense. Think about Job and all that he went through. There was no reason in his mind And there was no evident reason in anyone's mind for him to suffer the things that he did. He was not an evil person. He was a very righteous man, and yet he still suffered. And so if he'd relied on his own ideas, if he had just chosen to reject God because of these things, it would have been a misunderstanding, of course, because he didn't have the whole picture as we do in reading through the book of Job. And yet he chose to trust in the Lord. It's so easy for us as humans to rationalize our way into being our own standard. Think, think about what that even means, the, the idea of rationalization. That involves us trying to make something make sense, even when it may not, if we actually were objective about it. We, we, we take something that we want to be true, and we just work on ourselves little by little, even though we may recognize that it's not actually true, and that if we read Scripture, that it's, it's not actually what Scripture teaches, and yet, because we want it to be true, it's so easy for us, oftentimes, to just whittle away at what we know to be true until we've convinced ourselves, legitimately convinced ourselves, that that is actually what Scripture says, that that is actually what God wants of us, when in reality, it very well may not be. But the only way we can know for sure is if we rely on God's word and recognize when we are trying to rationalize, when we are trying to make things true because we want them to be true instead of submitting to whatever God may desire for us. In Galatians 6.3, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We are not the standard of anything. We're not capable of being the standards of anything. We don't have that kind of knowledge. We don't have that kind of wisdom and power to be able to guide our own selves through life without the help of God. Turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, 18 and 19. 
For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. What is Paul saying here to the Philippians? So he's talking about these people who walk in this certain way. What way do they walk? Well, they walk in such a way that their end is destruction, so they're not doing what's right, whose God is their belly. What does that mean? Do they, do they make a statue of, of their stomach and, and offer sacrifices to it? No. The idea is that their belly, meaning their physical desires, is just a, a part being represented for the whole of, of whatever they may desire physically. That's their God. That's their standard. That's what they owe their allegiance and their service to. They serve themselves. Whose glory is their shame and who set their mind on earthly things, on the things of this life, on the things that in the end, they don't matter except for how we respond to them in a spiritual manner. Because all that is here, all that exists now in the physical realm will not exist forever. And we can't take any of it with us. So it's easy to rationalize our way into this idea of, of we know what's best, we know better than what may clearly be said, or maybe even not clearly, that, that requires study to pull out, but still that is said in Scripture. It can be easy to form our own ideas. But that's when we have to engage in introspection. That's when we really have to spend time, as we spoke about this morning, working on ourselves spiritually, growing spiritually, and understanding exactly where we're at and whether or not we're listening to God or ourselves. You know, Satan wants us to hear any message but God's pure word. Sometimes we think that Satan's goal is to just make a, a, a group of horrible despots who will do every evil thing that can possibly be imagined. No, that's not his goal. He'd be just fine with people who don't really do anything, who don't really believe anything. As long as they're not on fire for God, as long as they're not doing exactly what God commands, trying to be better every day, recognizing they are flawed, but not being content with where they are, growing constantly, as long as they're not there, perhaps they may even be warming church pews every time the doors are open. But as long as they're not truly doing what God has said, as long as they're not truly following the messages God has put in his word, Satan's content. That's his goal. If we fail to accept God's word, even partially, if we fail to constantly grow and, and try and learn more about what God wants from us, if we discover something in God's word that God requires of us, and we choose not to accept it, not to apply it in our lives, we're giving Satan exactly what he wants. We can learn a good deal from others, as we've already said. We can learn a good deal from the world, from other Christians, from ourselves, in that sense. But only if those messages that we take in are consistent with God's message. So I want to encourage us tonight to hear God's word and no one else's. To hear God's word, no matter what else may come, no matter whether it's coming from ourselves or, or any other source, because only then can we truly be pleasing to God and accomplish our purpose for which we exist on this earth. As always, the Lord's invitation is open. If there is anything that we can do as the family of God to, to help you, to encourage you, to pray for you, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing.